Good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing well tonight. My name is Todd Scholl. I'm the lead learner at the SCEA, Center for Educator Wellness and Learning, or COOL as we call ourselves. I hope you've had a great start to your school year. And uh, to those watching tonight, then welcome. Welcome. I hope that you are going to enjoy um, tonight's webinar. Um, tonight, we are going to hear from Dr. Rena Hirsch. She is currently the coordinator of professional development curriculum and instruction for the MERS Good. Goodwill Excel Centers in Missouri. In her role, she acts as curriculum developer, instructional coach, PLC facilitator, PD program administrator, technology integrationist, onboarding specialist, and an occasional substitute teacher for four private nonprofit adult high schools. She's a passionate advocate for high quality relevant learning experiences for both students and staff. Her commitment extends beyond traditional professional development into creating job embedding learning and facilitating seminars on effective tools for stress management and prevention. She spent 16 years as a middle and high school teacher before moving into a full-time leadership role. She has a master's in the art of teaching secondary English from Brown University and a an, uh, doctorate in uh, teacher leadership from Walden University. She's currently pursuing an ed specialist degree in school administration from Northwest Missouri State University. She's a lifelong learner. Uh, she aspires to inspire and support teachers, and that's exactly what we do here. So without further ado, let's bring in Dr. Rena Hurst. How are you doing tonight? I'm great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and to get to kind of share this avenue of work with you. Thank you. Yeah, when I was um, kind of promoting the work, one of the things that came to mind was, I don't know if, if you've seen the show Ted Lasso, but um, there's a show called Ted Lasso, and in it, he quotes Walt Whit Whitman's, be curious, not judge. I mean, not judgmental. And so mm -hmm. I really I really that that phrase really is something that I've been trying to remind myself of when I find myself being judgmental, kind of trying to switch over into a mindset of curiosity rather, rather than judgment. And so um, I'm very curious what you have to share with us tonight. I'm excited to learn with you and just want to thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom and insights with us tonight. Well, thank you so much. I love that quote. I also really appreciate the um Benet Brown work that also talks about curiosity and compassion. And I think there's a lot of overlap. So the first um, screen is really just my contact information and a link to the slides, which everyone is welcome to view. And, you know, write down that short link, use it, abuse it, <laughs> you know, and take advantage of that. Compassionate curiosity is something I've become really passionate about because I think that as educators, we do a great job of helping new professionals understand content and understand management, but we don't do a great job of helping teachers learn strategies for self-regulating their own thinking and their own emotions in ways that translate into positive classroom experiences. And that's really where compassionate curiosity has a lot of traction. So we start with like what weighs on your heart, right? Teaching is tough. And the things that make it tough are not the really tangible things. It's not the stress or the hours or the paperwork or the micromanaging or the pay or the lack thereof. It's not even the vitriolic, you know, political pushback. It's the emotional and psychological toll of those things while you're trying to make a thousand decisions a day and have your heart be centered on your students' welfare. And that's really where we have the greatest strain is the combination of those things. And so I love to show this video. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you know, it's on YouTube. It's really great. I think it'll play and you'll hear the audio, but if not, Todd, you'll have to troubleshoot for me a little bit. Let's see. Can you hear the audio? Mm, not yet. No, unfortunately, I don't. Okay, huh. let me see. I think I know. I feel like I read something about it's something about how I have to share it. And there's a button I'm supposed to click and I maybe didn't. No worries. I'm curious. It's, it's there's uh, something it, where, aha, I found it. It's some little uh, share system audio thing that I okay. remember reading and then I totally forgot to do. Uh, 
<laughs> Let's try it one more time and see what happens here. Oh, shoot, still not hearing it. Hmm. You don't hear it? No, uh, unfortunately, I don't. All right. Shoot, I'm trying to see if there's anything on mine. A lot of this is really captioned, so the music is just background music. Okay. Um, there are some others where that's not the case, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> Did you happen to click? There was a button in the bottom left-hand corner that said share audio. Yes, that's what I went back and did. Oh, shoot. Okay. Because I remember reading that. <laughs> So I want you guys, I mean, we could keep watching it, but it's a little hard without the music, right? Well, one of the things I love about that video is that it's not just the students, right? But also the adults who have so much more depth to what's going on with them than what you can see in their behavior or their interactions. So when you think about that, then it becomes important to kind of, what do you do with that knowledge? So this is a question and if you want to you know respond to that you can if you don't you can't but just kind of think about how familiar are you with that concept of compassionate curiosity and if we get some uh, responses that's great if not that's okay too Let's see. the goal really today is for us to recognize the purpose and benefits of compassionate curiosity give it a good definition, and then translate that into some really specific concrete strategies, all right? And practice some strategies, some of those strategies with some kind of case studies, all right? So that way, you're, it's not just the sort of intellectual idea of compassionate curiosity, but what can you actually do with that tomorrow in your classroom, in your life, all right? So the purpose here is really about taking an intentional approach, right? One of the things that's really hard to do when we are faced with high emotion is be intentional about how we approach or respond to that emotion so that instead of being reactive, we are proactive in creating the outcome we want. The second piece of that is creating healthy emotional distance, not internalizing, all of the damage and drama and high emotion that's getting thrown at us in ways that double the burden for everyone. Right? Building strong relationships, which leads to right, improving classroom culture and management, and then creating psychological safety for ourselves and for the individuals we interact with. Right? And so the benefits when you practice compassionate curiosity intentionally 
is that it helps us share our calm rather than joining someone else's chaos. We've probably all heard that phrasing, right? You have to share your calm, not join their chaos. But how do you do that? What is the what is the trick to putting yourself in a position inside your own head where that's possible? And that's really what compassionate curiosity can do for us. Promoting a positive and sustainable perspective. So not toxic positivity, but a reasonable, sustainable perspective that still retains enough optimism that you don't succumb to negativity, compassion fatigue, et cetera. That emotional distance that's one of the purposes also protects us from compassion fatigue and vicarious or secondary trauma and relatedly burnout. When you are protected from those things, it reduces stress, right? You can foster appropriate and positive relationships more intentionally and in ways that are safer and more positive for you and your community. You can still demonstrate care and you can cultivate a caring community culture without sacrificing yourself, right? So I'm gonna start with some definitions. These are my definitions and they are not medical definitions. There's lots and lots of ways to define these terms. And some of them are probably medical and much more nuanced. But for me, the differences between sympathy, empathy, compassion, and self-compassion are subtle but important because they do mean different things. And the language we use influences what we think, how we think. Yeah. And so we start with sympathy. And sympathy is the act of feeling sorrow for or pitying someone else. That's how I think of it. And I find it problematic because it centers you as emotionally superior to the person for whom you're feeling sorrow or pity. And so the example I always come back to is the Free Britney movement. We've probably all heard about the Free Britney movement. So many people felt so sorry, had so much sympathy for what Britney Spears was going through that they felt they were completely capable of taking action on her behalf and competent to determine her mental health status, even though they've never had any personal contact with her. Right. So it centers you as emotionally superior. And then those who are on the receiving end because of that often perceive it as condescending even when that's not the intent. So while it can mean there's a congruence of feeling, that's rarely how it plays out in modern settings. So if you think about times when you didn't want sympathy or you got annoyed because of sympathy or someone offered sympathy and it backfired or you offered sympathy and it backfired, you can start to see where perhaps because sympathy doesn't have its roots in equality and that there's some problem with how it works for us. It's not to say it's not important, but it isn't the best place to build those positive relationships from. Empathy is almost the other end of that. It's the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. So it can center you by making your feelings as important as the other person. And we get that a lot where, oh, I know how you feel because when I dot, 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 or this one time I had to dot, dot, dot. So it can be very tricky not to center yourself as as important or more important than your conversational partner when you're expressing empathy because we have a tendency to want to share how we understand how we know how to share the feelings that person is experiencing the other problem for me with empathy is that it requires both individuals to carry the emotional and psychological burden and that can be really damaging to yourself because you're taking on someone's feelings you know they say a trouble shared is a trouble halved but psychologically and emotionally, empathy means that a trouble shared is a trouble doubled because now both individuals are carrying that burden and neither of them are focusing on how to set it down. Right? So it's super valuable, incredibly important for understanding others, but it can also really be a cause of vicarious or secondary trauma and that's a limitation. Compassion, right, 
is recognizing validating the feelings of others. So this is more aligned with where we want to be when we are trying to work with students or colleagues, right? You can relate to the emotions another person is experiencing, but you're not trying to claim those emotions as, one, as your own. You're not expressing sorrow or pity that someone else is going through that. You're validating those feelings and moving on, right? Beth Roganson defines compassion as empathy with wisdom. And I really like that definition because compassion is complex, right? Compassion requires seeing others as equally valuable and valid and seeing their feelings, even when you don't agree or understand, as equally valuable and valid as those that you have, regardless of those circumstances, right? Now, what do you think, Todd? Am I going to be able to play this one? This is another little video that I really love. We can try it. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm not sure why. If you click that button, it I should. I wonder if if I try it on YouTube, if it will do for, do it through YouTube, and it just doesn't like my power my slides. And we're gonna we're gonna oh. give it a go, and if it doesn't work, that's mm -hmm. okay too. But we'll give it a try here. Mm -hmm. Um, this video is a little bit oversimplified. I cannot tell a lie. It is a little oversimplified, but it is also kind of a brilliant take on ways that you can foster compassion. All right. Can you hear that one? I can't. Nope. <laughs> do, you, do you hear it on your end? Yes. Yeah, I'm not hearing it for some reason. Let me try removing it and then see if you can share again. Just let's try okay. it one more time. Let's just let's we'll just do it. Do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah, stop sharing and then start to share again and, and then click that button and just see what happens. And All if right, it doesn't work, so just skip it. And maybe you can just yeah. describe. It, you know. Absolutely. Let's see if I come over here. Do you have a link? Do you, can you, someone suggested maybe linking, texting me the link in the private chat to your. Oh yeah, I can definitely do that. And let's, let's see if, let's see if my sharing it helps. Okay. Let's try yours That's one more great. time. And if that doesn't work, let's try sharing. Let's try sharing. Mine. All right. So you want the link to this uh, presentation? The slide show, yeah. And then, I'll, and then I'll try it and see if it works. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't. Sure. Absolutely. We, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Shelly. Shelly is the one um, who um, suggested yeah. I that. I wonder, we'll too, I haven't, I haven't I, this is my first go around with StreamYard, which is always an adventure. There is an option yeah. when it says share that says slides. Okay. And then Google Slides. So I also Let's wonder if that happened. would have an impact. Let's see what happens when I share slides. Slides. Let's see. Share my screen as well. I'll share my screen. I want to share. All right. Do, do, do. Share screen. Share this screen. See what happens. Hold on. Hold on one second. All right. Sure. I don't see that thing <laughs> for the audio, though. All right. Let's see if I go over here. I didn't see it until the second time I did it. And it was like down at the very bottom where I didn't think it would be. <laughs> All right. So let me uh, skip through to this video, which would be right, that right there. Yeah. Let's try it and see what happens. Amazing. Nope. Uh, the audio is coming through. I wonder why. That's really strange. It's like coming through my computer, but it's not coming out. Hold on, let me try. Y'all, y'all watching. Thank you so much for your patience. We're, we're <laughs> doing Be technology curious. is both our hero and the bane of our existence, that's, right? That's right. That's right. Let's try. Hold on a second. Let me see if this if that does it. Let's see. We're gonna figure it out one way or another, maybe. Nope. Still not doing it. <laughs> Let's see. Um. Settings, audio. Let's see if I do the 
MacBook. See, it's not even letting me do that. Mm. Huh. It's not letting me do what I normally do. I one other thing I might be able to just put my mic up to the right. video. Let's try that. Let's try that. Sure. Let's try this. Our amazing brains are a combination of old and new parts. We have an old brain which developed millions of years ago and the earliest humans evolved from apes. The old brain is where we hold our basic instincts and emotions. This kept us alive in very different times when we needed to respond immediately to threats. Most animals only have this type of brain. Our new brain has developed in the last few thousand years. The new brain is what makes humans special. We use this part of our brain to do lots of incredible things. It gives us imagination, creativity, planning, and self-awareness. However, old and the new parts of our brain don't always work well together. On its own, the old brain responds very quickly to danger, making us alert and ready. But when the threat passes, it quickly calms down. Think about a zebra being chased by a lion, which immediately stops to enjoy some grass as soon as it escapes. In humans, when the old and new brains interact, they create loops. These loops can keep an emotion going for a long time as we keep going over and rethinking a challenging experience. And this can make it difficult to get calm and settle as we ask ourselves questions like, why did that happen? What could have happened? Whose fault was that? What if it happens again? Questions like this can be very difficult to switch off. They keep us in our stress state. Even after a threat or a challenge is gone, it's really hard to make thoughtful decisions when your brain is in this loop. Our old brain emotions create loops which shape our minds in different ways. Because they shape our minds in different ways, we can think of them as our different emotional selves. Angry self, anxious self, and sad self. In a challenging situation, these emotional selves are difficult to control. And they can also conflict with each other. Angry self thinks anxious self is a wimp. Angry and anxious cells stay away from sadness. These conflicts make threat situations very hard to manage and tricky to resolve. However, in challenging situations, we can choose to show up as our compassionate self. Our compassionate self helps us to recognize the feelings and behaviors of our angry, anxious and sad selves. Our compassionate self can give us permission to take a step back and choose words and actions that will help to calm and improve the situation. This can give us the space to ask, how would my compassionate self respond in this situation? Our project, Developing a Compassionate Mind for Parents, helps us understand the feelings created when the behavior of your child is challenging. We can see that these are very normal emotions caused by our tricky old and new brains. If our compassionate self can recognize our angry, anxious and sad selves in difficult situations, it can also help us to make thoughtful decisions which reduce confrontation and improve our relationships. But you can kind of see there, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, right? Oh, that's but an amazing. Video. I've never seen that one before. It's a really powerful kind of way to think about the value of compassion and self-compassion and the way that that relates to the growing understanding we have of trauma. Like those feedback loops to me feel very much like how we're starting to understand trauma. Right. And so there are two other little short ones here, Todd, that I think are really important. Okay. This next slide is really about compassion fatigue, because it is something that 
almost everyone suffers from at different points in their career, right? And you start to feel it often without noticing it. And it's that danger of constant empathy or compassion. And really, the simplest definition of compassion to you is running out of care. We all know what it's like to run out of whatever's to give. Right? And compassion fatigue is when that becomes your actual chronic emotional state, right? But it can be counteracted with self-compassion. And I don't want to confuse that with self-care, where self-care can start to feel like another thing you're supposed to do, right? Self-compassion right. is a little different. So that signs of compassion fatigue video is super, super short, but I love it because it includes some things it would never have occurred to me to include as signs of compassion fatigue. Let's go ahead and watch that one. That's super short. It's like a minute long. And it, it, the video, the audio on that one is not as important as the um, imagery. That's why I like insomnia seems pretty obvious exhaustion makes sense right but i don't tend to think about the physical pain the mood swings as much and then there are a couple that really get me watching tv at night watching high trauma media is entertainment feeling not good at my job and not enjoying what i do and then dread of working with certain individuals. Too much venting is often a sign of compassion fatigue. And then poor eating habits. And then not feeling good about yourself. Sadness and helplessness. So there are a number of these that feel very natural. But then there are some, like, how many people do we know who've seen every episode of CSI like 12 times? I have. It never have occurred to me that that was a sign of compassion fatigue. But it kind of makes sense because we have a tendency to binge watch those things when we're feeling emotionally exhausted. Right. All right. The other little video there um, is six. It's very also very, very short. Six ways to right. express self-compassion. I think I might have fixed the audio issue. Let's 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 keep our fingers crossed. Here we go. I'm crossing all the things. I'd be very excited. Yep, yep. there we go. Yay! Good job. This first one gets me every time. Take it personally. Be vulnerable. Be human. Change your self-talk. Oops, I'm so, I messed up. I accidentally. I, I am not having a good night with technology. <laughs> you and me both. Hold We're on. There together. Hold on. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Wait, wait, wait. I want to go back and finish that. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. We were right about here. Okay. Yeah. Why does it keep doing that? Oh my goodness. I'm know. sorry. You're it's fine. my fault. Hold on. Let me. I feel like this might be a MacBook I mean, problem. It, it might. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. All right. Let's, not, no, no, no. There we not go. At all biased, this right? is it, right? This is it. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go right back to here. I'm going to leave it like that for a second. Yeah. Five is like catastrophizing, right? Stop, stop catastrophizing. And then self spews do something that comforts you. And I honest to God think I love this video because of the first one more than any other. Take yeah. things personally. How many of us spent our like the, our entire like training as teachers being told not to take things personally? Have been told our whole careers not to take things personally. One, it's impossible. And two, it's not healthy. You have to take things personally because that's how you learn from them. That's how you get into that old brain and say, okay, I'm going to be my compassionate self and acknowledge that kid really hurt my feelings. Now I can right. choose what to do with that. But if I'm not willing to acknowledge that, it's going to come out in ways that are not going to be good for anybody. 
right? right. And so I kind of, I like that idea of just being much more real, right? So compassionate curiosity is compassion con- coupled with this desire to understand what is motivating someone else, right? And be intentional about that understanding. It has three components, acknowledging valid emotions, getting curious, and asking questions, and then engaging in joint problem solving, right? So the compassion is what creates the space for acceptance, for healing, and curiosity is what directs compassion as a positive conversational force. It prevents internalizing other people's feelings and helps you stay focused on how do we move forward to a resolution everyone here can live with? It forces you curiosity to take an intellectual interest instead of an emotional interest in what's happening. And that becomes very valuable when you're trying to share your calm, choose your approach intentionally. And so then we get into like, how do you actually do that? All right. So do you want me to share again or do you want to stay shared? I'll I'll stay shared and I will do my best to make everything work. I just wanted to stop for a second. Like, this is really, really like, this is something, a message I really needed to hear tonight. Like, um, um, co- coupling that compassion with the curiosity, because we can be curious about things and still be a jerk. Right. <laughs> you know, but like, I love the, I love the idea of you, of you coupling compassion. Yeah. And then how do we cultivate that, that type type of mindset? I think that's, mm-hmm. this is, and, and I think it kind of starts with ourselves too. Right. Like, mm-hmm. how do I, how do I can be, compassionately curious about myself because i think as educators we are often Absolutely. Very compassionate with ourselves but I'm i think that's watching. very true and i think it's it's really hard to do because again you have all these stressors while you have all of this care and compassion while you have to make hundreds of decisions at a time and juggling all of that is so difficult and often what gets lost in the shuffle is being aware of and staying in control of our emotional selves, right? And so I love this fr- this quote from Dr. Viktor Frankl. It says, everything can be taken from us but the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstance, to choose one's own way. So we always have a, a, a place where attitude is the basis of our mindset and agency. And that's the first step in really focusing on implementing compassionate curiosity because your self-talk determines your attitude. If you wake up in the morning and the story you tell yourself is, I can't, I can't go to this school again. It's awful. I hate it. This child's going to act this way and my boss is going to be this way. You're unlikely to walk in the door and recognize it when your colleague stops to share something good with you recognize when someone goes out of the way to get you your favorite kind of candy for lunch. You're not going to be attuned to the things that can help you see the positive stuff, right? right? So then you have to practice choosing your attitude and notice and adjust that attitude. And how you do that is difficult. This is another little video that I absolutely adore. Um, and it right. is really yeah, it is worth making bigger if you can because it's it's a cartoon, but it is delightful. It's <laughs> quite different to how people imagine it to be. Yeah. Maybe they have an idea. I'm having a hard time when I go to make it bigger. It's not going to. It doesn't want to stay. Yeah. Go to full screen. So let me let me go back and um, try. Um, can you? And see. Is it possible to open it like in a new tab? That's what I was, almost? That's what I was wondering. Now it's not uh, training the mind. Let's try it like this. Aha. Quite different to how people imagine it to be. Yeah. Maybe they have an idea it's about stopping thoughts or eliminating feelings. But the reality is a bit different. An easy way to think of it is to imagine yourself sitting on the side of a busy road. The passing cars representing the thoughts and the feelings. All you have to do is to sit there and watch the cars. It sounds easy, right? Yeah. But what usually happens is that we feel a bit unsettled by the movement of the traffic. And so we run out into the road and try and stop the cars, or maybe even chase after a few, forgetting that the idea was to just sit here. And of course, all of this running around only adds to the feeling of restlessness in the mind. 
So training the mind is about changing our relationship with the passing thoughts and feelings, learning how to view them with a little more perspective. And when we do this, we naturally find a place of calm. But we sometimes forget the idea of the exercise and become distracted. Of course we will. But as soon as we remember, here we are, back on the side of the road again, just watching the traffic go by, perfectly at ease in both body and mind. I don't know about perfectly. I feel like that might be a stretch. <laughs> but I do think that, that the point of that video where we're not worried about what we should be feeling, what we should be doing. Let's turn off that. Okay, there we go. Sorry, go ahead. Is so important because it's then about noticing all of the different things and making a choice about what to pay attention to instead of trying to stop the feelings or stop right the attitude or stop whatever thoughts we're having and i you know at the moment like so I, I think that there are ways in everyday classrooms that we all can relate to this but in bigger ways too so i think about my mom passed this summer which was rough right and grief is so complicated but i find myself doing a lot of like being hit hard and having to just sit that back and like watch that happen to me and wait yeah. and process and then get up and keep going instead of like letting it wash me away. And what happens to our students is they don't have those skills, right? What happens to our colleagues often, especially if we're triggered by a trauma, by a feedback cycle, is we get washed away in those moments and we can't take a step back and get control again. Right. So the next slide talks about the power of I. Right. And so if you're not familiar with Love and Logic, the Love and Logic Institute in uh, Colorado, the first book was Teaching with Love and Logic, and it's probably the single most impactful thing I've ever read. And he really talks a lot, the authors talk a lot about the power of I in self talk and interaction, because your language, again, influences just like your self-talk influences what your expectations are what your message is your attitude your internal responses and then your actions and reactions right and so everything is influenced by the story we tell ourselves and it's really difficult to monitor that in high stress situations or when we're confronted with people who are really dysregulated so like I always think about this, like no kid in the history of the world wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know what, today I want to misbehave in a super irritating way so I can get into an impossible power struggle that leads me to being in trouble. That'll be great fun. <laughs> that is not a story any child tells themselves. But we tell ourselves that story about our students all the time mm -hmm. without even realizing it, right? No teacher gets up in the morning and tells themselves the story. I want to have the most craptastic day today. I want to be irritated. I want to be short tempered. I can't wait to yell at some kid. Nobody does that. That's not the story that person is telling themselves, even if that's the behavior they're displaying. So the story that we tell ourselves, the I, is really, really important. And that leads us to that first strategy. So on that next slide, there's this strategy that's four questions. This is a self-talk strategy. If you can train yourself to ask these four questions, it will change how you run your classroom and your life, right? And I mean, I used to have these on the back of my ID. What story am I telling myself in this moment? Why? <laughs> What story could I tell myself instead? That's that curious part. How can I change my approach to improve the situation? So what do I have control over? And what is motivating the negative behaviors of others? Or what story is that person telling themselves? Right? Mm. And when you can really approach everything with those four questions, it's remarkable how big a difference it can make. So I'll give you an example. On the next slide, it just says, so what had happened was, and this <laughs> is the <this> story. 
this is an old story from years ago when I was in the classroom. I had this student, we'll call him Stanley. And Stanley was the student who looked for honest to God every opportunity to be as rude and disruptive as he possibly could. And in the beginning, I mean, the story I told myself was that Stanley was a problem I had to manage. And that he behaved this way on purpose. This was a choice he was making. But as I got to know Stanley and interact with Stanley, I had this revelation that that story is super convenient, but it's really inaccurate. Blaming Stanley for his behavior <laughs> relieves me of the responsibility for his learning. It's very convenient to do that. That child is choosing not to learn, choosing not to behave. So it's not my fault. And we have a tendency to conflate fault and responsibility, right? So when I started to recognize that his behavior was motivated by insecurity, everything changed. Like I started trying to tell myself that Stanley was trying to avoid anything he didn't feel he could do. Turns out that's basically everything. But when my self-talk changed, so did my response to him. So one day Stanley, and he didn't did stuff like this a lot, right? I'm handing out vocabulary quizzes and he grabs it out of my hand as violently as he could. He's expecting me to what? Get irritated? Yeah. Start a power struggle? Let him out of taking the test by kicking him out of class eventually? <laughs> like this is the scenario that he's become accustomed to and I just smiled and was like yeah rudeness is not going to get you out of this I walked away and I can tell you with absolute certainty he did not take that quiz <laughs> he did not take that quiz but he didn't continue acting out either and so gradually my response to his behavior disarmed his attempts to task avoid because I changed the story I was telling myself and that changed the story we wrote together. Mm. And so that's really what's from like one, one of those moments that is very telling for me where the ability to take a step back and really think about what story you're telling yourself and really think about what story is that other person potentially telling themselves and get curious about how you can find an outcome everyone can live with is where you make progress. And I think fault and responsibility is one of those things. Uh, there's a wonderful video Will Smith made about separating fault and blame and responsibility. And essentially it comes down to as much as we want them to go together and it feels natural, they just don't. I am not to blame when someone hits my car does not change my responsibility to call my insurance company and the police. I am not to blame if my parents were abusive, ignorant, neglectful, but I am responsible for managing that trauma so I can live my best life. Blame and responsibility don't go together. It would be convenient if they did, but they don't. And so we often start unintentionally looking for ways to find fault so that we can feel less responsible, right? We start looking for ways to feel less responsible because we're afraid we're going to be at fault. And when you can separate the two, it gets a lot easier to manage some of those impossible expectations, right? So, the next slide is just an example. Martin is a student who is physically well-developed and sociable with his peers. Academically, he shows little interest or ability, and he spends much of his time at the back of the class, drawing in the back of his books and listening to his iPod. When asked to get to work, he picks up a pen but does not complete any work. Left alone, he's not a problem, but other students are now asking how come he, can't, he doesn't have to do anything. We've probably all known this kid, <laughs> maybe many times only, over. Mm. When you think about those questions, what's the story I'm telling myself? Almost always, initially, the story I'm telling myself is Martin does not care, right? Martin is not invested. He does not care about school. He does not care about my class. 
but I could be telling myself a whole lot of other different things, right? Martin doesn't seem to have a lot of friends in my class. Martin isn't working independently, and I'm not sure why. Right? Martin is very attached to his device. Martin likes to draw. Right? Those are all stories I could be telling myself. So how can I change my approach in that morning, in that moment? What can I do differently? Well, maybe I can have a conversation with Martin. I can incorporate drawing into my lessons. I can try to find peers who want to draw him into some of the work. I have options there about things I control, right? And then that fourth question becomes, what's motivating those behaviors? And as I get to know him, I can learn what story he's telling myself, which most of the time is, I would rather choose to fail than try and fail anyway. Underlying, I mean, the vast majority of death avoidance behaviors is this story that I would rather choose to fail than try and fail anyway. That fear is a psychological driver for a lot of our students. That's mistaken goals. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. So that's one strategy, those four questions. And they found, form the foundation of the other two strategies that I use a lot, that I'm always practicing and you never get good enough at them. <laughs> like, there's no end point in this game, right? The second one is non-judgmental investigator, right? So asking caring questions, monitoring tone, listening without judgment, these are hard things to do, right? Like, we're human. All we want to do is judge. This is how we're built. And it can be very difficult to ask open-ended questions and avoid making assumptions about the responses. To wait and give people enough silence that they will really start to share. To monitor your tone so that that person believes that you really want to know what they're saying. All right, I'm super guilty of that one. To make sure your face isn't saying something different from your words. I'm often like, I'm sorry, did my face say that out loud? That was not my <laughs> intention, right? You have to yeah. be very aware of that. That's part of your tone and to be curious and then listening without judgment. And acknowledge that you don't know everything. You might not have the answers. All right, so this uh, slide 21, the next slide is an example. They call it empathetic em empathetic listening, which is a very kind of similar thing. It could be the same thing. I call it non-judgmental investigator. But this is a clip from a movie we're probably all familiar with. But it's a great example of one, that listening skill and two, what teachers often do instead. <laughs> so let's play that one and see. No! No, 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 you can't take my rockets in the dark, Riley, and I go to the moon! <laughs> Riley can't be done with me. Hey, it's going to be okay. We can fix it's this. A need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. <gasps> hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. <laughs> oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back and died, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness. It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah. Sad. <laughs> oh. 
I'm okay now. Come on. The train station is this way. Mm. How many of us can can say like we've been that teacher who's like, oh no, it'll be okay. Hang on, here's a distraction. Well, what if we just we're trying to rush that process, right? And the result is usually that it takes longer than just stopping and sitting down and being a non-judgmental investigator and listening for a couple of minutes because you can't set aside emotions you don't get to acknowledge. You get trapped in them. Right. So this is a little bit of a practice scenario. So you have Angelica, who has a history of high performance and good behavior, but now her best friend is moving. Right. She doesn't really have any other friends because she only came to this school last year. But her attitude is having a negative impact on the whole class. And even when other students are trying to interact with her, they're not getting much response. So on the next slide, there are the reflection questions about that scenario. What caring questions could you ask, Angelica? How are you feeling about this move? Mm. What are you worried about? Right. When, when will you get to see your friend? Right. How did you make friends with her? All of those kinds of things. What tone and that or attitude should you avoid? And this is a classic of, but it'll be okay. You'll make new friends. Right. Yeah. How do you listen without judgment? Is this the end of the world? Like in a literal sense, no, it's not. And it's really hard not to judge this as somebody taking something too seriously, right? And then you get into those self-taught questions that help you be a non judgmental listener. So what story am I telling myself? Am I telling myself, man, she's a friendly girl. She'll get over it. Yeah. Am I telling myself, well, I had to move every three years as a kid and I turned out okay. What am I telling myself? What could I be telling myself instead? Right? Mm. How can I change my approach to improve the situation? And then what's motivating that behavior? What do we know about Angelica's home life? Why is she so invested in this one friend? Right? What can we do to help her deal with that loss without trivializing it, which is super hard to do? That's where you start to be like a different approach. It does take time and it's hard to find that time as a teacher. But as we saw in that clip, right? If you can take a little time on the front end, you're gonna lose less time in the long run. I wanted to take a, a minute just to kind of that that was really really a powerful powerful um uh piece there and I, I literally did almost exactly what you're describing today was i don't want to say who it was but it was somebody i'm close to called mm -hmm. me up with a problem and i immediately wanted to fix it and i immediately wanted <laughs> to shoot and go hey but you know here's here's what you could do and this and it's fine it's not it's not, it's not a, you know it's not a big deal you'll be all right it's going to be okay and I immediately, and I think part of the reason why we do that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think part of what we do is it's out of compassion, but it's really out of like a, an unco being uncomfortable with somebody who's in distress or somebody who is expressing so some kind of difficult emotion. And you're like, gosh, how do I sit with this? How do I deal with this and not absorb it and not you know how, to, how you know so we want to we want to immediately lift them up and shift their attention mm -hmm. and i think it's positive intention but i can see now that that video clip is so clear on how it's counter almost counterintuitive but it it works so much better to sit and allow the person to process mm -hmm. the emotion and to show that compassion yeah. not a, i yeah. agree and i think that there's a couple of easy ways to give yourself space for that and one and she does it in that clip is to kind of say i hear you feeling x right am i right mm -hmm. that you're upset by and the other yeah. is just to say just just these three words tell me more about how you're feeling like about that and yeah. that's just just taking the time to do that 
that gives you a little breathing room and it gives that person a little breathing room so that you can try to like sit with that discomfort because i think you're exactly right that that's really it comes from a, a a desire to not be uncomfortable and to not want anyone else to be uncomfortable or unhappy right. yeah. yeah yeah and it's it's a, a dangerous thing because you can wind up in a place where you are inadvertently dismissive yes of those feelings right right then they feel invalidated they don't think you understand and then they don't want to confide in you anymore and it's, yeah i totally see that and i have to keep reminding myself of that because it feels right it feels compassionate to say hey you know cheer up it's going to be okay mm -hmm. but sometimes people just want you to listen they don't want advice i've learned to one of the things that i've tried out recently is to say do you want me to just listen or do you are you looking for advice yeah and then that's people one of the things you know, i've practiced too is and what kind of as a coach what kind of conversation do you need right now do you need a coaching conversation do you need a listening conversation mm. do you need a problem solving conversation what role do you need me to be in right now and it's really hard to remember to do that but it's super helpful when we can yeah. absolutely yeah all right so the last one is re recognizing mistaken goals and mistaken goals are they're essentially four right attention power revenge relief and avoidance of failure and they're from uh rudolph Dreikers. he calls these mistaken goals that drive behavior for short-term satisfaction that are motivated by these psychological factors that supersede all ability to consciously consider long-term consequences mm. when you're making behavioral choices so when we can create situations environments communities that meet the needs for attention power support relief so that students don't need revenge don't have that same fear of failure because they assume we assume they want to be successful a lot of behaviors just take care of themselves and that's an amazing thing um to, to watch happen so this little video gives you like a very brief overview of rudolph dreikers mistaken goals sort of theory okay let's check it out i'm gonna go to Dang. youtube <laughs> yay success mm -hmm. not the boss of me i can't i mean i've not all heard that a thousand times I'm taking revenge bullying disrupting and then that big one i think is hiding inadequacies and i think actually the fear of failure is the most powerful in classrooms i really do i think power probably comes really close but the one that to me i see so consistently is this desire to avoid failure or avoid looking or feeling stupid. Yeah. All right. So let's look at an example that next time we've got Amy, who's very talkative and social. She's constantly asking simple, simple questions. So she asks for directions to be repeated about every single step in it in her process. She interrupts class instruction, conversations between you and other students to ask more questions without any regard to what's happening around her. When she's confused, she asks the same question over and over again. Other students have become increasingly irritated with Amy's interruptions and have begun to respond rudely to her, which exacerbates that behavior. I've had lots of Amy's. <laughs> and one of the things that I had to accept at some point is that lots of students don't know how to ask questions. It's really easy to say to a student when they say, I don't understand. Yeah, but what don't you understand? And the answer is almost always, I don't really know. <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> I would tell you if I knew. I don't know, right? But we want them to know. And so it's really easy to put the burden back on them of trying to figure that out. So you think about the reflection questions that are on the ne next slide. What mistaken goal might Amy's behaviors represent? what is she trying to accomplish and then how can you respond to those behaviors so you go back to those four questions 
what a story am I telling myself about Amy? Do you look, there are days when the story you're telling yourself is that child is driving me to madness. <laughs> like, what is happening? Sure, but what could I t be telling myself instead? She has a remarkable amount of persistence in pursuing some understanding. She really wants to know how to do whatever it is she's supposed to be doing. And just that switch, right, alone, right, from irritating to persistent is big. What can I do? How can I change my approach to improve the situation? Well, who do I have who constantly wants to answer every question? Because we all got one of those, too. And they should probably be partners. That might change that situation, right? Amy has someone to ask questions of, and Joseph has someone to talk at constantly. There we go, right? Two, two birds, one stone. <laughs> what else could I do to change my approach? When can I give Amy opportunities to answer questions? How can I help her self-regulate the questions she's asking? Hold them in, count them. We used to do this experiment sometimes with blurters, because we all have blurters sometimes, where for a week, I would not chastise them. I wouldn't do anything, but they had to keep a post-it note on their desk and they had to make a tally mark every time they blurted. it. And then mm -hmm. we looked at those numbers at the end of the week and they were always like, wow, I, I thought I only interrupted like four times. It was 47. <laughs> right? Okay, so now let's make a reasonable goal for next week. What do you think? <laughs> like, maybe let's see if we can get it down to 40. Oh, no, I can get down to 10. Let's try 40. Let's see where we go. Some of those kids get so involved with those tally marks, they stop blurting because they're busy thinking about if they're going to blurt. <laughs> <laughs> you just replace the bag. <laughs> You're right, giving them something to focus on. That. But that's where you get into it, right? How do you respond to those behaviors to help that child figure out their motivation and manage, self-regulate? so that what they're doing still meets their needs and you're meeting the mistaken goal so that they can get onto the real business of school and the learning that we want to take place. So those are those three strategies and they're very closely related, right? And you've got to use them strategically and that takes practice, right? And you practice with a partner, right? Pick one, start with one and just try it for a week. Like I said, I used to have those questions on the back of my ID. I have them on the wall in my office. I can do them in my sleep. I still screw it up all the time <laughs> because it's almost impossible not to, right? Practice yeah. with a partner. Get somebody to hold you accountable for trying it and reporting back on when you fail because <laughs> that happens all the time, right? Practice self-compassion. Like You have to be forgiving of the idea that this is not easy or natural for most of us. And again, Use the strategy strategically. Notice that's on there twice. Not every strategy is going to get you the result you're looking for every time. And so that strategically might be starting with just the four questions and not worrying about the rest of it. Strategically might be identifying one student who you think has a mistaken goal and strategizing with someone else about what else you can try with them. And then don't give up. Just keep trying. The last video is really just kind of a tearjerker. But when you think about the stories we tell ourselves and the stories other people tell themselves, it's a really powerful message. So I'd like to end with that. The only thing past that are my contact information again and then references. We'll come back to that for sure. Let's watch this video. Let's check it out. <laughs>
love that video it's such a tearjerker but it really is about like how much power the stories that we tell ourselves about each other and our own selves matter and how big an impact changing that story just a little bit at the right moment can really have for someone mm. yep. and that's really where it what it is to be compassionate and curious right looking for the stories to tell amazing i was just i've thoroughly enjoyed i'm sorry about some of the technical issues we had the, the content was got through i i hope those yeah. watching um got out of it the same thing i mean it was just it was a message i absolutely needed to hear today and it's a message that i've got to i, I, I need to keep this recording and sh and watch it you know, once a week, once a month, just to keep coming back and kind of keep my true north, you know, that mm -hmm. it's moving in the right direction because it's, um, it's powerful information and it's important yeah. and it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to forget. And it's things that sound so simple, but are so intensely difficult to manifest all the time. Right. Yeah. And so I, and I think it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And the next step for me is really starting to push into what the business net world has started calling compassionate accountability, Yeah. which is similar to the warm demander kind of teacher speak, right? But now how, what's the next step? Once we can do this, how do we then move forward to hold ourselves and our students accountable for the learning we want to do? Yeah. yeah yeah amazing work um thank you so much for your time dr hirsch absolutely um, this is a wonderful wonderful content just so many so many things that i'm gonna be chewing on over the next couple of days um i really appreciate right. it um mm -hmm. if you'll hang on I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little close and then i'm gonna come back and just want to chat with you for a minute before before you sign off i'll, I'll be right back absolutely all right, y'all, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope you enjoyed the con tonight's content. Um, I want to thank Dr. Rena Hirsch. Um, I want to want you to know that you can connect with us. You'll be able to find this webinar and all the webinars that we do on this website right here, cool.us, that's C-E-W.us, C-E-W-L.us. Um, head on over to that website. You'll scroll down. You'll see the video section, and this, this video will be sometime later this week. Um, by Friday at the latest, uh, this video will be um, posted to that website. I also want to invite you to connect with us at the SCEA. You can do that by going to the SCEA.org slash connect. Fill out that form and that you can connect with us. Love Would love to connect with you. Uh, whether you're a member or not, please uh, check out that form. And I uh, want to encourage everybody to get out there and vote. If you're not already registered to vote, please make sure you do that soon. Um, I know you can vote early, um, but you, everybody wants to be uh, registered to vote. Um, you can find out more information at the SCEA.org slash votes. Uh, you'll find out who we're endorsing, which obviously uh, uh, Lisa Ellis, for, um, superintendent of education, uh, so excited about her candidacy and hope that we can, as an education community, get out there and support her, a fellow educator, uh, get our families out there, our moms, our dads, our sisters, our brothers, our friends, our children, everybody's eligible to vote needs to get out there and 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 make it happen um uh and and last but not least 
you can see at the bottom of the screen, um, we've brought in over 700 new members this summer to the SCEA, and we're so excited about the movement that we're building. It's a, it's a strong movement, but it's stronger with you. It's stronger if we are together. We use a collective voice to advocate for the things that uh, educators deserve, that students deserve. And those two things go hand in hand because we know that um, our educators' um, teaching conditions often end up our students' learning conditions. And so we have to advocate for our educators uh, to, to recruit and retain the best people to put to lead our classrooms. Um, we would love to have you in the movement. Please just go to jointhescea.org or you can text the word JOIN to 48744. Again, that's jointhescea.org or text the word JOIN to 48744. And if you have any ideas for content you'd like to see, uh, you can contact me, toddshul at gmail.com. We're really excited about uh, what's coming up on Thursday. It's going to be the first in a series. If you remember last year, we did some roundtables, and Rick Whitmore led those roundtables. Well, uh, Rick has moved to uh, Florida, and we're, we wish him nothing but the best. He did such an amazing job with these roundtables, and we're so fortunate that Pete Stone, who's the president of the Tester County Education Association, is decided, has agreed to fill in and take take over this uh, these series of roundtables. The first one is Thursday night. It starts at 7 o'clock, and that's this Thursday, and it's called The Urgent Need to Stop Radical Misinformation from Ruining Education. We hope that you will spread the word about this um, this roundtable. I think it's going to be, a, we if you look at that, lineup of guests. It is going to be an absolutely incredible conversation. You can be a part of it. We can bring in your comments. Um, it'll be an interactive session and it will be thought provoking and, and a discussion that is uh, absolutely needed in today's climate. I want to thank again, Dr. Rena Hirsch for being here. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you hopefully Thursday night at seven o'clock. Have a great week, everybody.